Hi, and welcome to the video on hypercoagulability. As we have been discussing Virco's triad, this is the last one that contributes to uh, thrombosis. The first one was, was endothelial injury. The second one, second one was stasis or turbulent blood flow. And the last one is hypercoagulability. Now, this does not contribute as much as endothelial injury injury or to the stasis or aberrant flow of blood in your in your blood vessels but nonetheless it does contribute so what is this defined as is is any alteration of the coagulation pathways that predisposes to thrombosis that's what hypercoagulability is means it just means that any change within any of the these coagulation pathways that predispose you know the body or an individual to forming blood clots there's two types there is one is the primary or the genetic and two is the acquired so let's talk about a few of these i'm not going to talk about all of these but you can look them up and study these on your own if you'd like but the the first most common of the primary or the genetic is the mutation in factor V gene or factor V leaden. And as you can see from the coagulation pathways, factor V is right. Oh, let me change colors here. Factor V is right here. And factor V, uh, once it's activated, along with activated 10, convert prothrombin to thrombin and then thrombin helps complete the cycle to the blood clot. So what happens is that there is a single point mutation. So when you have nucleotides, uh, guanine, adenine, cytosine, and thymine, and you have all those and you know there's a DNA sequence C G A T T A C you know whatever your DNA is but these are the nucleotides and these are the basic building blocks of your DNA you know you got millions of these and trillions of these if you will and they are coming down you know and they're they form your DNA well on one chromosome in uh, you know one part of your your DNA there's a single switch somehow this the DNA gets gets blocked or whatever or gets mutated somehow and this guanine right here switches to an adenine so that's it instead of C G A T T or whatever this guanine gets switched to adenine and what that causes is that causes it, you know, we'll go more into this into the cell biology and, and, the, and how, you know, your DNA is converted into uh, RNA and then that's red and, and that's converted into amino acids. And, you know, there's a codon, which is three, three amino or nucleotides equals one amino acid and that each sequence or each number sequence can, codes for a different amino acid. And what that ultimately means is that instead of CGA, it's CAA, for example, and that codes for the R gene amino acid gets substituted for glutamine in the amino acids. So G to A switch of the nucleotides, which converts into an A to G switch of the amino acids. And what that does is that causes a mutation inside of factor V. So now, how that further progresses is there's a protein that's called protein C, okay? And protein C is kind of a natural part of your oh, natural uh, uh, anti-thrombotic or it, it, it prevents, you know, as I've said in the past that, you know, this contact activation or this intrinsic pathway is always trying to promote a blood clot and you have natural products natural things in your blood that is preventing or causing an equilibrium between these two these two pathways well act or protein C is one of those inhibitors this inhibits the conversion protein C can inhibits the conversion of factor 5 to the activated form of factor 5
So once this protein C becomes activated, it inhibits this. Well, if you have this mutation in, in, uh, in the factor V gene, factor V leading, you have this point mutation which then converts one nucleotide into the wrong one, which ultimately leads to a switch into one of the amino acids, arginine to glut glutamine, then that makes a change inside the uh, protein that makes it not completely, but strongly resistant to the normal uh, process or the inhibition of protein C. So that makes it more prone, you're more prone, prone to bleeding because factor V is converting to factor V-A, which is promoting this. So if you don't have this inhibition step, well then it's a full throttle, more gas, if you will, more, more um, coagulability. So the same thing with a mutation in prothrombin gene. You see here the prothrombin here. And if you have uh, a mutation there, there is, there, there is more prothrombin in this case. When you have a mutation in the prothrombin gene, there's more prothrombin. And once you have more prothrombin, then uh, Le Chatelier's principle, uh, according to chemistry, will drive the equilibrium to the right. Which means that if you have, it's like if you're baking a cake. If you have 10 eggs, and then someone gives you 20 eggs, then you're going to have more cakes. You're going to be able to bake more cakes. Um, that that might have been a poor example, but hopefully you understand that that if you have um, if you have a conversion of one molecule to another and you increase the the sheer amount of one on the left, it's gonna you're gonna you're gonna have more substance to convert into the desired substance. So in this case, mutation in prothrombin gene, you're going to have more prothrombin, that's going to get converted into more thrombin, and you're going to be more likely to form a blood clot. So these are the most, these are number one and number two, these are the most common of the primary or the genetic uh, changes in the hypercoagulability. The second is the acquired. Oh, let me just go through these rare. So there's mutation in the methyl tetrahydrofluorate gene. They're the more rare than that is the antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, and the very rare is the fibro fibrinolysis defects. And you can, you know, why don't you try to see if you can figure out why if you had a protein C deficiency, why um, you would have more blood clot or be prone to more blood clots. So the second, the second part is the the hereditary or or sorry the secondary or the acquired conditions or hypercoagulability states. You're at high risk for thrombus if you you have prolonged bed rest or immobilization. Um, so people that sit in hospital beds for a long time are very prone to blood clots in the lower legs. You got to get them up walking. You got compression boots that you wear, all types of different things. If you have a heart attack, myocardial infarction, atrial fibrillation, tissue damage, you know, whether it's surgery, fractures, or burns. If you have cancer, prosthetic cardio, cardiac valves, disseminated intravascular coagulation, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Now those are all uh, more of a high risk of thrombosis, and those are acquired or those are secondary. If you have cardi cardiomyopathy, nephrotic syndrome, hyperestrogenetic states uh, like in pregnancy, if you take oral contraceptives, sickle cell anemia, and smoking, you're at a risk for thrombosis, but not as high of a risk. And so. Hopefully that kind of you kind of are getting the sense of these hypercoagulability syndromes and it's any alteration in the coagulation pathways that predisposes an individual to thrombosis or forming of blood clots. We'll see you in the next video.